Just after college, I moved to Los Angeles for a year, and I lived in a meditation community. I met a really good friend there, Kevin. He was a gentle man, a skilled carpenter, and we would get together for lunches, and we always had a really nice time. When I told him that I was going to be moving to Berkeley to earn a PhD in psychology and reconnect with an old boyfriend, he didn't say much. But in those weeks before my move, he came by a lot, and we went for long walks by the ocean and had great conversations. About a month after I moved, I received a letter from Kevin. And in that letter, he spoke of his feelings for the first time. He told me that he loved me. And he wanted to consider a future. I remember sitting by the ocean reading his letter over and over, scared at how much I wanted to say yes. But I'd just made a promise to someone else, and the implications were overwhelming. So I ignored Kevin's letter. A few weeks later, I saw him at a large public lecture, and, and during a break, our eyes met. He waved, he was friendly. I was fighting back tears. I wanted to go and talk to him, but I lost my nerve and I walked out. And I never saw him again. But I've often wondered why I couldn't muster the courage to face him or my own heart. Why was I so unkind? In difficult moments like this, many of us find ourselves avoiding topics or quarreling, and we do hurt other people in the process. I'm an avoider. But as a psychologist, I've learned how kindness can help. We can enlist empowered kindness to be candid without being mean. We can learn to say anything with kindness, even during our most difficult moments. Empowered kindness allowed Arthur Rosenfeld, a Tai Chi teacher, to diffuse hostility at a Starbucks one morning. He had pulled in for coffee and the cars were moving very slowly when this guy in the car behind him started honking and yelling for him to hurry up. Naturally, he flushed with anger and his fight instinct surfaced. But as a martial artist, he remembered that there's always three options in a moment like this. He could avoid or fight, but he chose kindness to shift the dynamic in a hostile situation. When he pulled forward to pay for his coffee, he also paid for the coffee of this man behind him. He figured this was just some guy having a really bad day, and they could both benefit from a little kindness and he drove away happy. Well, this man in the car behind him was so touched that he bought the coffee for the person behind him, and that set off a driver-to-driver -driver coffee generosity movement that lasted most of the day. We've all heard about random acts of kindness, but this was actually something quite different. When he was interviewed, he explained that his was an act of consciousness, not at all random. He chose intentionally and purposefully to use kindness. It's so easy to let our emotions take over in moments like that, to let our fight and avoid instincts surface. But we can choose consciously. And when we choose kindness, it can spread contagiously. We could start a kindness revolution in that way. And wouldn't that be nice? Blood boiling incivility has become a national pastime, and it stresses us out. Kindness actually lowers our blood pressure, and it elevates our moods. It leads to the release of chemicals that help us to feel safer, so we connect more easily to other people, and we're more cooperative. Kinder people live longer. In fact, the benefits of kindness are so powerful that if we could distill them and market them as a nutritional supplement, we would all take it. 
Kindness acts like salve to soothe the scrapes and bruises of life. And it's not just the recipient who benefits. If you're kind to me, I'll benefit. But you will equally benefit. Both our brains will fire with powerful chemicals, creating a biological win-win. I've been reclaiming kindness in my own life with a kindness practice that I started about five years ago. I was walking across campus one day when I encountered a group of four young women engaged in cheerful conversation, and they unwittingly bumped into me and they knocked me off the sidewalk. They were so engaged with each other that they, they barely noticed me. Even as they walked right into me, I was already stressed. And this just made me mad. But I didn't say anything. I avoided. And then I stewed. I came up with snappy responses that I could have said. And I kept myself upset for most of the day. I knew I was being petty. And I started to imagine the kind of life I was going to have if I kept this up. A lonely and grumpy old woman surrounded by my family of cats. <laughs> and I knew something had to change. So I came up with a plan. It was a solo plan. I launched it uh, with no fanfare. I came up with three words to add permanently to the signature of all my outgoing email. Be kind always. These words are aimed at others. They need to be kind, always. Well, my new signature does create a bit of a stir, and people start to talk to me about kindness, like I'm some kind of expert on the topic. Be kind, always. It ends up that the words are kind of catchy, and some people tell me they're using them as a measure of their actions. And though I hadn't intended that for myself, I start to wonder about if I could. Other people's incivility still peeves me, but I start to get curious about my own. And I think it might be kind of interesting to be kind always. I start by bringing awareness to my email and to my driving, and I strive to give up gossip. And I find by holding myself to this intention, I do feel better. I'm happier. So I commit to a practice. I am going to choose consciously to be kind always. But then, of course, I start to notice all the times when I'm not kind. I'm really committed to the practice. And I've even learned to, to avoid less in my relationships. So what happens to me when I'm unkind now? I figure out that it's my thinking. It's my judgments that trip me up. This is something I actually learned about myself back in elementary school. In sixth grade, I uh, worked in the school kitchen to earn my lunches. And in our school, we loaded the lunches, the trays full of food inside the kitchen so a fully loaded tray would arrive at a pickup window for each student. It was my job to scoop canned peaches onto every tray. Nikki was a girl in my class. She was heavy. She uh, was inconsistent about her hygiene. She'd reached puberty early. I just had an attitude about her. So I calculated which tray was going to be hers. And for three consecutive days, I scooped no peaches onto her tray. I was picking on her. So when my teacher took me aside, I knew what she was going to talk about. I was a good kid in general, so I knew this was going to be about peaches. My teacher's simple words have stayed with me. Jamie, I know Nikki looks different, but you're hurting her feelings. Please, do, do what's right. Well, my little sixth grade heart skipped a beat. First off, my teacher didn't scold me. She was kind. She took the time to step inside me to understand my actions. And then she took me inside Nikki so I could understand hers. And I was able to, because my teacher's kindness had opened me. 
Nikki and I didn't become friends, but I always did scoop peaches onto her tray after that. But most importantly, I stopped judging her, and I started relating to her as another child just like me. And I recognized that, like me, Nikki needed kindness. On my journey to becoming kinder, I've realized that unraveling judgment is a monumental act of kindness. It's monumental because it's very difficult, especially when we're feeling righteous, when our fight instincts surface and we feel entitled. But we can. It just takes a little effort to slow down some and to consider that our thoughts are just judgment. Our judgments are just thoughts, not even necessarily accurate. And they can become lenses through which we view others as opponents and maybe even treat them that way. Alternatively, we can use a just-like-me lens, and through this softer lens, we can be reminded that others are pretty much all the same, like us, equally human. And we can understand each other. We all make mistakes and cry and get impatient and bump into people on the sidewalk. And we all open when we're treated with a little kindness. I'm not suggesting here that we ignore incivility. Quite the opposite, actually. We can be strong and say and do whatever is needed, but with kind intention. One day on my way to work, a young man on a skateboard jumped off the sidewalk right in front of my car. I honked my horn, and he made it safely across the street. I was expecting a humble, sorry, but this guy flipped me off. I filled with indignant anger, and I admit it, I had the thought, I should have just hit him. <laughs> but I'm already into my kindness practice a couple of years, so be kind always comes to mind. I find it's harder to be empathetic when I'm angry, but I stay with it. And I figure he was probably scared, just like me. And I've had fear turn to anger before. I know what that's like. With that shift in my thinking, my anger softened. And the truth is, I'm really glad this guy was not hurt. I can feel that. And that feels good. Kind. Kindness is so powerful that it can turn situations completely around. And by choosing kindness, we can do this together. We can start a kindness revolution one situation at a time. Thank you.